hey, good morning. If we haven't met, my name's Chris. I'm the pastor here at Christian Chapel. And whether you're in the room or online with us, we're thrilled you're making part of your Sunday uh, worshiping together with us. We're in the middle of a message series that we've called Witness, Tell Your Story. And over the past, uh, I think, four or five, six weeks now, we've been exploring some of the, the New Testament conversion stories where people encounter Jesus, their lives are changed by Jesus. And then he not only sets them on a new path, but he often uses who they used to be as part of who they are now and uses their story to tell other people about his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, a new life. And so what we've kind of been asking on our way through this is if Jesus did that then, then what does it mean for me now? And I know each week, maybe you've identified with, with different ones who've encountered Jesus. Last week, we talked about uh, how Jesus comes for self-righteous people, that when we think we are good enough, he reminds us we never are. He uses us despite uh, how good we think we are. Today, we're going to go kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum from that, and we're going to talk about sketchy people. So I don't know. Uh, again, nobody really likes to identify as self-righteous. I don't think anybody probably wants to identify as uh, sketchy either. So we won't personalize it. I'll let the Holy Spirit do that to you. Uh, but just let's, let's think for a moment. How many of you would say, I know sketchy people? Okay. Um, how many of you have ever worked with sketchy people? How many would be willing to admit maybe at some point in your life you might have done something that someone else would have called you a sketchy person? Okay, yeah. Uh, now we'll stop there. We're not going to ask you who lives with a sketchy person, who married a sketchy person, who's raising sketchy people, right? Like if you've got three-year-olds right now, you feel like you're raising, raising a sketchy person because all three-year-olds are sketchy. They just, they lie, they steal stuff, they do all kinds of, you know, you hope that then they'll get baptized by fifth grade uh, and, and it'll kind of work itself out. But, but we, we kind of all understand that idea. How many of you have ever, you know, maybe kind of at work, you've either worked or encountered sketchy people? Right, so, so we know kind of what we're talking about. Generally what we mean is when, when somebody's sketchy, it's not so much that there's like, Oh, they do some shady things every now and then. It's, it's this idea that at the core of this person, something is broken to make them incapable of speaking truthfully, of engaging honestly, to where you, you never really know, can I trust what they say? Can I believe what they're telling me? Is this rooted in reality at all? Or is it, it, and so most of the time, if you're around sketchy people, it's because you're sketchy, Right? Uh, we, that's just kind of, we, we are who we're around. Uh, but, but other times you encounter people and you tend to shy away from them. If you get that, that impression of them, what we're going to see this morning in John chapter four, though, is Jesus comes for sketchy people. So if, if there's stuff in your life that you spend a lot of time hoping no one else finds out about today's for you. If there's stuff in your life that you know, people know about, but you just wish they would forget about today's for you. Right? If you interact with people that you think are beyond hope or beyond redemption on a regular basis, today's for you. Really, it's for all of us because there are sketchy people all around. And if we're really honest, we will all admit there are times, places, seasons of life where I, the only way I can identify myself is as a sketchy person. So in John chapter 4, we find Jesus on his way. He's traveling from one spot to another, and he goes through an area called Samaria. He encounters this woman with a very, very shady past out kind of on her own. They, they have uh, a discussion together about what it means to follow God. Jesus invites her into new life, and then she actually accepts and becomes one of the first evangelists in church history bringing people to Jesus, bringing a whole uh, little village into relationship with him. It's an incredible story, but it starts in John chapter 4, verse 4, with this simple statement, now he had to go through Samaria. Now, Jews did not go through Samaria. Right? They, they avoided it at all costs. So, so for a little context, Jews and Samaritans were rivals, they were enemies, they were on the opposite side of almost everything in life. They, at one point, the Samaritans had kind of split away from the nation of Israel. They claimed to be true worshipers of God, and yet they didn't worship in the temple. They didn't observe a, a lot of the law. And so for the Jews, they felt like the, the Samaritans were outcasts. They were unclean. They were wrong. They were heretics. I mean, it's, it's very much like today where when two people have an idea of what is right about one thing, but they're on opposite sides of it, they just kind of hate each other. 
Right? Like, like if, if this had been today, they would have fought on Twitter. They would have fought on Facebook. They would have fought in person. They would have said horrible things about each other all of the time, any way they could. And so good Jewish men like Jesus and his disciples, if they were traveling from one place in Israel to another and they had to go through Samaria, there was always a better route around Samaria. And so what John tells us here in John chapter 4, verse 4, is now he had, Jesus had to go through Samaria. So with some of that context in mind, we can read Jesus had to go in the same way that we think of some of the places that we have to go. Right? Like, like maybe this week you have to go to the dentist. It's not where you want to go. It's not where you plan to go. Nobody ever schedules vacation and thinks, I think I'll go to the dentist for a couple of days, right? You, you don't go to hang out. You don't go to do fun stuff, but you, something compels you. You have to go there. And that's how we think of Jesus going to Samaria. Well, he's going there because he has to, but he probably doesn't want to because it's a sketchy place full of sketchy people. And we think of it the way we think of, well, I have to go to the mechanic. I have to go pay my bills. All of these requirements that are placed on me. But, but I don't think that's actually it. In fact, I think there's a better way for us to understand it. So the, the, the PGA Championship's in town this week, right? If you, I don't know how you could live in Tulsa and not know what's going on. So it's here. It's everywhere. The big Goodyear blimp here for the golf tournament, in case you were wondering, right? So, so they're there. And um, I don't know about you, but I, I've got several friends who they have... Uh, been blessed with jobs where this week they've been able to say, I have to go to the tournament, the golf tournament for work. This is my job. Babe, I have to go. I don't have a choice. I have to go to the practice rounds on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. I have to go to the opening round on Thursday. I have to go Friday. I have to go Saturday. Some of them are still, they're still having to go this morning and they're, they're having to go and they're out there. And the, the justification is why I'm, I'm hosting clients. Right? This is part of my job. I, I, I have to be here. On, uh, earlier this week, there was a, a friend from Christian Chapel who sent me a message and said, hey, I have two tickets uh, to the, the PGA Championship on Friday. Would you like to come? And so I told Angie, babe, I have to go. <laughs> like, it's, you know, it's a church member. I think maybe, maybe there's some soul care that I can do <laughs> as we're walking the, the fairways. I, you know, I don't, maybe, maybe Tiger... Uh, just needs me to watch him and be an encouragement to him in this season of his life. But, you know, just that, like, we use this phrasing at times. Sometimes we say we have to, when in reality, what should we say? I want to or I get to, right? I want to go to the golf tournament. I get to go to the golf tournament. But we, we phrase it in terms of work because it, it, you know, just makes us feel better and kind of justifies, no, 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 I'm, I'm really, I'm working out here, working hard, working hard. So when we hear Jesus saying, now he had to go through Samaria, I want you to put it more in that context. Jesus wasn't going to Samaria with some kind of begrudging, dragging his feet, head down, can't believe I have to go here. When it says he had to go to Samaria, we could easily read it. He wanted to go to Samaria or he got to go to Samaria. This was a place Jesus wanted to go. And what John is teaching us is that Jesus goes to sketchy places. Right? Which makes sense, because if Jesus came for sketchy people, he's only going to find them in sketchy places. He's going to go to them in the places that other normal religious leaders avoid. He's going to interact with the people that others normally turn away from. And what we see all through Jesus' ministry is that he is constantly showing up in unexpected places, and he's happy to be there. Which is good news for us, because it means if there are sketchy moments in your life, if there are things you wish Jesus wouldn't talk to you about, if there are some things you wish he would just leave you alone with, but you feel like, well, he has to come up and he has to say this to me. He has to come into my darkness, but he'd rather be with these people because they're a lot better. He has to come over here in my sorrow and my misery and bring comfort because that's what he does. But I know he'd rather be with the more successful people who have it all together. What John chapter 4 is teaching us is Jesus wants to go to the darkest points of your life. It's not an obligation to him. It's not something he gets upset about. But he came for sketchy people, which means he has to go to sketchy places. And so the darker your life is this morning, the more certain you can be that Jesus is moving towards you in that darkness. And he's not showing up just to say, well, there, I, I, I crossed off that list on my, <clears throat> my kind of messianic job requirements. I did the things that got it. No, he comes because he wants to be there, because he longs to draw you out of where you are and take you on a new path with him. So, so it's comforting to us if Jesus always shows up. 
And as you, you keep reading the story, we get a little more context. It's not just a, a sketchy place. It says he came to a town in Samaria called Sakar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. So John's setting, setting this up for us in a way that, that if we live in the first century, we immediately understand all the awkwardness of this situation. But for us, 2,000 years removed, a completely different culture, we maybe don't pick it up quite as quickly. So there's a, a couple things that are happening here. The, the first one we fully understand because we live in Oklahoma. Right? In Oklahoma, we know about heat. We know about when it's uncomfortable outside. Right? Like July and August are coming for us. And it's that same, I don't know about you, it's the time of year where I wonder every year, God, why do I live here? Like, why did, can we move Christian Chapel? Like, can all of us just agree in the summer we're going to move to the mountains? Like, if you'll be there, I'll be there. We can make it happen. We'll find a school to rent. It'll be awesome, right? Like, all of these things, I, I wonder all the time because I, I hate the heat. I hate when it's 110 and humid. I hate when it feels like the wind is blowing and it's a blow dryer in your face. Like there's, there's no pleasant part of that. And so we know as people who live in the heat, we know you don't do stuff in the middle of the day. Right? There's none of you that decide, hey, if I'm going to mow my lawn, I'm going to wait till noon. Right? You try to get it early in the morning or late in the evening. Sometimes you have to. If you're a runner, you know you don't run in the middle of the day in Oklahoma. And unless you have a death wish. That's the only reason you do it. You don't work out. You don't do anything. We know early morning, late at night. Same thing in this context. Women went to the well early in the morning, late at night. It's a hot climate. You don't do hard physical labor in the middle of the day. And yet Jesus encounters this woman. She's a Samaritan. He's a Jew. She's a woman. He's a man. And he's going to know if she's showing up at the middle of the day, there's something wrong with her. And, and so what we're beginning to see, and we'll, we'll get into it more as we get into her story, is there is something in her past that's ruining her present. Right? There is something she has done. In a best case scenario, she's just bad at her job and shows up at the wrong time of day. In, a, in the worst case scenario, which it actually is, there's something in her that has isolated her from her community. Where she has either been told by the other women of the town that she is unwelcome to go with them in the morning or the evening. Or she has decided that she's tired of being mocked. She's tired of being ridiculed. And so she would rather go in the middle of the day than the end of the day. When she shows up at the well that day, she's, she's literally symbolic of what sin does to you. And she's, she's carrying the weight of this one or two giant jars that she's going to fill with water. Her, her, her forehead is covered in sweat as a reminder to her that no matter how hard she works, she's never going to outwork her past. She's there and she's alone. She's isolated as a reminder that everything she has done has only ostracized her from her community. As we read through John chapter 4, when we talk about sketchy people, it's not just kind of a little lighthearted, yeah, I've done some shady stuff. It's a, no, 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 when I embrace sin in my life, it always isolates, it always ostracizes, it, it always drives me away from other people. It always makes me think I can work or earn my way out of this only to be disappointed that I can't. You see, when, you, when you're carrying that kind of weight from your past, it poisons everything you're doing in the present. It affects every relationship. It affects every interaction. It makes every low point even worse. It makes the high points not as exciting. And this is what's happening to this woman. Her past, she literally carries it with her everywhere she goes and everything she does. She can never escape it. And yet Jesus shows up. And despite all of the obstacles, he engages her in a conversation. So as you, as you go on to verse 9, you see her response. So Jesus is sitting there. He sees her walk up, and he asks her for a drink. In verse 9, it says, The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And so, so John, as he writes his gospel, he makes sure we understand exactly what's going on. This woman isn't just being rude to Jesus, saying, Why are you talking to me? But, but she's literally, her mind is blown. The cultural expectation is that Jesus would have come to the well and he would have sat there and never acknowledged that she even existed. She would have come, she would have drawn her water without ever making eye contact, ever looking in his direction because she is a woman and he's a man. So there can't be a conversation unless they risk some form of the appearance of impropriety. 
She's a Samaritan. He is a Jew. So she knows. He, he, he and his whole people look down on me. They think I make him unclean. He won't want anything to do with me. And then she knows she's there because of her shame. And Jesus, because of who he is, knows exactly why she's there in the middle of the day. And so there's dozens of reasons that they should not speak. So when Jesus speaks to her, it takes her off guard to the point that she thinks Jesus is sketchy too. Because what kind of man, what kind of Jewish man speaks to a woman in her condition in this place? This is one of the most common accusations that's thrown against Jesus. Time and time again, the religious leaders come at him and they say, why do you spend all your time with tax collectors, with drunkards, with sinners? Right, when there's a woman with a, an equally shady past to this lady who comes and she pours oil on Jesus' feet and begins to wipe his feet with her hair, those gathered around say, if he knew what kind of woman this was, he wouldn't let her touch him. Again and again and again, the accusation is made against Jesus. If he's hanging out with all these sketchy people, he must be sketchy too. And yet Jesus tells them the same thing he t- still tells us if he hangs out with sketchy people because that's why he's come. It's not the righteous who need him, it's sinners. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. He's came to seek and to save that which was lost. This is his whole job. It's his whole calling. And so he doesn't go into these situations thinking, well, I guess I have to because no one else will. But he walks in joyfully seeking to build relationships with those that the rest of society has rejected. And it's great news for us because it means Jesus isn't afraid to be associated with you. He's not worried that your reputation is going to tarnish his. He's not doubting that you should be welcomed into his family. He's just coming to extend this gift of life to you. In fact, he goes on to tell the woman in verse 10 exactly what that looks like. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus ignores all of her sketchiness, and he just lets her know, hey, this is why I'm here, and this is why I've come. He ignores all of the barriers that should separate them and lets her know, I'm here to satisfy the deepest longings and needs of your soul. It seems that the woman is is at least somewhat receptive to this idea, but before Jesus finishes his time with her, it it seems almost like there's one quick twist of the knife. Verse 16, it says, he told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you have now is not your husband, What you have just said is quite true. And this is the the stomach punch moment. This is Jesus airing all of her dirty laundry. and, And he does it to make the point to you, me, her, and anyone everywhere who will ever read this story. That Jesus doesn't just come for sketchy people. Jesus doesn't just have plans for sketchy people. But Jesus has plans for super sketchy people. Right, the, the worst of the worst. Because again, we can all kind of agree of like, yes, we're all sinners. Christ died for all of us. I understand that. And yet sometimes we're made to feel that our sins are somehow more outstanding than all the other sins of those around us. And we, we learn either we're taught it in church or we just kind of picked it up. Or sometimes it's just the lies of the enemies coming at us telling us that, yes, your sins are worse. Yes, your shame is greater. Yes, your addiction is darker. And because of that, Jesus only wants a little bit to do with you, not a lot. And so in this situation, he tells the woman, hey, I'm bringing you living water. I have gifts of life for you. There's a new way possible. And instead of just sending her on her way, he first stops and says, But I want you to know, it's really for you, and it's for all of you. I mean, could you feel her heart drop when Jesus says, go and call your husband? Just that, like, that moment of, oh, here we go again. I thought I had hope. I thought this would be different. I thought this would be the place where where maybe this, this new teacher wouldn't know my past. And yet he's went straight to it. And and so she tries to kind of wiggle around it by just saying, I don't have a husband. Probably hoping that Jesus would say, don't worry about it. Go get a friend and come back. 
But Jesus doesn't do it. He's directed the conversation to get to this darkest point in her life. So he says, I I know you don't have a husband. In fact, you've had five husbands. And the one you have now is not your husband. Now, we're never told what happened in her first five marriages. We don't know if they left her, if she left them. We don't know if if there was unfaithfulness on one side or the other. We don't know if maybe some of them died. Maybe all of them died. We have no idea. All we know is if you've been married five times, life has been hard. It's been difficult. It's been filled with heartache, filled with grief, filled with loss filled with rejection and pain. And there's a world around you looking at you and judging you every single time. And then when Jesus highlights the fact that, so you've had five, and actually the one you're living with now, you're not even married to. She thinks probably at this point, well, surely this has disqualified me from this living water. Now that he knows everything about me, I'm sure he doesn't want anything to do with me can feel her dejection and it almost seems cruel of why would Jesus do this why does he go out of his way to call out the most embarrassing parts of her life I think the reason he does it is so that she knows he knows everything about her and he still loves her he knows everything she's ever done and he still has plans for her So that she knows the living water he offers is not just living water that's going to come and cover over who she used to be. But it's living water that's going to come and flow down into the deepest, darkest parts of her soul. And Jesus still does the same thing for you and I. When Jesus shows up in our life, he brings with him the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes and begins to shine the light of Jesus into the darkest corners of our heart. And it's not always pleasant. It's not always something we want to engage in. In fact, you can, you can read later in the story. We don't have time to get into it today. But this, this woman tries to kind of redirect the conversation. Oh, well, let's not talk about my husband's. Let's talk about this kind of theological question over here. And we do the same thing. The Holy Spirit comes and he begins to convict. He begins to shine his light on those dark secrets, on the things we hope never, no one will ever find out, on the things we hope people will quickly forget. He shines his light in the places where where we would just rather not have the conversation. And in John 4, we're reminded that Jesus loves to talk to us about the things that we don't want to talk to anyone about. There's no corner of your heart that Jesus doesn't care about. There's no part of your past that he doesn't want to address. There's no struggle that he's unconcerned with. When he says he is living water that flows up from the depths of your soul, it means he goes deeper and works more powerfully than anything the enemy has planted in your life. But then we can also understand that the woman, she needs to know, Jesus knows who you are and what you've done. Because in a moment, he's going to tell her, now go back and tell everyone. But she has to know that Jesus knows all of it already. Because if not, she's going to go back to town and they're going to immediately dismiss her. They're going to start throwing her past against her as reasons they can't believe her. And it's the same thing for you and I. If we won't let Jesus work deeply in our heart, then as soon as we start to take a couple steps on this new path he has, the enemy will weaponize our past against us and use it as a reason we can't pursue the future God has for us. That's why Jesus does a deep work of healing in every single one of us. It's not to rub your face in your failures. It's to set you free from all of them. It's to enable you to say, that might be who I was. But Jesus knows all about it. He set me completely free. And not only do I not have to do that, but I don't even have to be ashamed that that's who I used to be. That's just part of my story. But for far too many Christians, stop short of that point. The Holy Spirit comes and begins to convict in those corners that we haven't surrendered. He comes to speak about the parts of our past that we've never been honest about and never let Jesus work in. He comes to to tug at the things that we think we have hidden away where they'll never be seen or known by anyone else and to remind us that he's come to bring life and life to the full. And that means into the deepest and darkest corners of our heart. But we decide we don't want it. It's not worth the work. It's not worth the effort. I don't want to risk the embarrassment. I don't want to risk the vulnerability. So Jesus, just let me have that and you can have everything else. 
But in, in the same way, baptism symbolized for us this morning, like nobody who was baptized just got a little wet. Right? I mean, this is a, a, a new little baptism tank for us. And, and I know you can't see it, but they come and they sit down. And then there's a little shelf that I lower them back down on. First service this morning, we had one or two people. I forgot to tell them, like, I'm going to lower you down until your head touches the bottom because that's the only way the water is going to cover your face. So there were a couple of them I lowered down. And that last, like, three inches, they were kind of fighting me. <laughs> Pushed them all down. They all got completely wet, right? We're not doing a halfway baptism. Nobody's getting up with like, his hair's not wet. They are all getting all the way wet, right? Baptism by immersion, not baptism by kind of immersion. That's what we believe in. That's what we practice. I I think it's a model of what the gospel shows us. When you come to Jesus, it's not, hey, he's going to dunk you all the way down except for the last little tip of your nose. It's not, hey, he's going to save you except for that last little thing, that last element of shame, that last little addiction. He comes to set you completely and totally free, which means he's going to talk to you about the things you don't want to talk about. He's going to convict you in the spaces you'd rather he leave you alone. He's going to love you enough to reveal the depths of your soul so that you know he sees you at your worst. And he loves you and has a plan for you. This is what he does with this woman. He's not trying to be cruel. He's not trying to be vindictive. He's not trying to elevate himself above her. He's just letting her know, I see everything in your life and I still love you and I still have a plan for you. Sometimes for for some of us, we've picked up the idea somewhere along the way that Jesus loves 98% of us. And there's the last 2% in each of our hearts that he's still thoroughly disgusted by and doesn't want anything to do with. And he's just hoping we can manage it on our own. Yet what we see in John chapter 4, what we're reminded of in baptism, is the salvation Jesus brings is complete and thorough. It reaches into the darkest corners of our heart. It is complete and total redemption. There is nothing you hang on to. There is nothing you keep from him. And when you began to embrace that kind of new life, you can't help but tell your story. That's what we see happen in John chapter 4. It says, Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two more days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. When sketchy people are are changed by Jesus, they have great stories to tell. And when you know Jesus has changed the the sketchiest parts of your heart, you can't help but tell other people. I mean, notice, notice her reaction. As soon as she understands Jesus knows me fully, he is the Messiah, and he has a plan for my life, she forgets why she even came to the well that day. She leaves her jar behind, and she sprints back to tell the people who've rejected her how great Jesus is. I mean, she runs back in. She's not saying, oh, this is awesome. He knows me, and now I can pretend that number six is the first one. I can move to a new town where nobody knows me. I can start over fresh. She doesn't do that. She runs back to town and she says two things that probably made the whole town roll their eyes. The first thing she does is she comes in. She says, come see a man. This woman's been married five times. She's living with number six. She's had a lot of come see a man conversations. And there's been a lot of times where she's told him, hey, this is the one. Hey, come meet the one. Hey, come meet the one. Hey, come meet the one. And she's been let down again and again and again and again. But this time there's something different in her eyes. There's something different in her tone because there's something different in her heart. And her message to her community is come see the man who told me everything I've ever done. Jesus knew everything she'd ever done. She knew everything she'd ever done. But I don't know if any of you have ever lived in a small town or not. You know who else knew everything she'd ever done? Everyone in that town. She lived in a small town and she'd been married to five men. 
And there's probably nobody in the town that she wasn't married to one of their relatives at some point. Like she used to be my grandpa's wife. She used to be my uncle's wife. She was married to my son-in-law. She was married to my cousin. She was married to my brother. Down the line, they could go all over town. Everyone knew everything about her. That's why she's off by herself. Isolation, she thinks, is the only place she can escape her past. And yet, when she's transformed by Jesus, she doesn't try to hide who she used to be, but she uses it as a stage to tell others about who has come and who has intervened and the message he has. She says, come, see the man who's told me everything I've ever done. He might be the Messiah. And they begin to run out with her. The people who didn't want anything to do with her, there's something in her demeanor. There is something in her language that compels them to go and see what's happened. And it says they go out and they encounter Jesus and they begin to listen to him. And they too are taken by him and they invite him to stay with them for two more days. In that days, Jesus continues to teach them. He continues to reveal who he is to them. And it says that many of them believe in him. And they tell the woman, now we believe not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard from him ourselves. And, in, and it's really just a, a big reminder to us that, that we have to let Jesus use our stories. Your story isn't going to save anyone, but your story will create a space for Jesus to save them. She went back and said, hey, come on, come, come see the man who's told me everything I've ever done. Don't you think over the course of that next two days, Jesus probably told a few other people everything they'd ever done? She wasn't the only one with a shady past. I mean, do you think that there's so much of that in the scripture we'll just never know, but, but do you think it's possible maybe one of her ex-husbands was in the crowd? And maybe Jesus told him about everything he'd ever done? Maybe he told him how he had wronged her? Maybe, we don't know. All we know is the people of the town look at her and they tell her, we believe, not just because of what you said, but because you introduced us to him and he told us. They receive Jesus as the one who has the words of life. And this woman with a sketchy past, with a sketchy story that no one wants to interact with, she becomes the first evangelist in the church. She preaches that Jesus is the Messiah before any of the disciples preach that Jesus is the Messiah. She, that group of Samaritans are some of the first people in the world to place their faith in Jesus as the Messiah. And it all started with one woman being willing to tell her sketchy story. And she said, you all know it, so here's who I am. Come see the man. Come meet the one. And for some of us this morning, that, that's going to hit us in two ways. For some of us, it's a, it's a realization that there's some sketchy parts in my heart and my mind. There is darkness that I've become comfortable with. And this morning, you need to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit saying you are not meant to live that way. Jesus has come to bring complete and total freedom. His living water won't just cover over your sin, but it will flow down to the deepest, darkest parts of your soul and will begin to well up within you like a spring of living water, pushing up and pushing out everything that is not compatible with his new life. And for others of us, Jesus has done that for us. But somewhere along the line, we've been deceived that we can't tell the story of who we used to be. You've bought into the lies that if people know what you used to do, if they knew who you were before Jesus, they wouldn't want to hang out with you anymore. They wouldn't want to be around you anymore. But what we learn from John chapter 4 is your story contains the seeds of salvation for those around you. Right? And, and, and here's the other thing. We always think that we have somehow like covered it up and no one knows how sketchy we used to be. They almost always know. Right? I, I can tell you as a pastor, in, in, in going on 20 years of doing this, there's, there's almost never been an, a time where somebody has come and said, hey, I've got some sketchy stuff in my life that I was just shocked and caught off guard. Why? Because that, that stuff goes before you. That stuff filters into the world around you. We can see that darkness on your face. We can sense that loss in conversation. So every time I've had those talks and somebody says, hey, there's stuff in here. It's not a, oh, that's gross. Get away. But instead the response is, thank God. So glad you're ready to talk about that. 
Now let's see what Jesus wants to do. Let's begin a path of restoration and healing. Let's let him work deeply and fully. And he does it again and again and again. I know my willingness to let the Spirit work in the dark corners of my heart has been enabled by the willingness of those who've gone before me to share their stories. Now, it's my job to share with those who are coming after me. It's your job to share with those who are coming after you. So whichever side you land on, either, hey, there's some dark spaces and I need Jesus to work, or Jesus has worked and I need to tell my story. There's a response that's required from every single one of us today to participate in the life that Jesus is bringing to us. We stand with me. I want to pray for you. The band's going to come and lead us in a final song. Jesus, we come today recognizing that you came for us at our lowest moments. That our sin and our struggle does not cause you to move away, but it's the very reason you came. And so now, Lord, we invite you to speak and to move. We invite you to reveal and to heal. Before we move on, will you take your hands and put them out in front of you with your palms facing towards the sky with me? This morning, I, I believe there are people in the room that you still don't believe that Jesus loves you at your worst. You still don't believe that you can confess and be accepted. You still think somehow your story is exceptional, that your sin is stronger. Now, I want to encourage you this morning, the same way that your hands are open, will you begin to surrender those lies? Will you begin to surrender that pride? Will you begin to surrender that darkness and that addiction? Jesus, will you come and bring your healing and bring your forgiveness? Holy Spirit, will you come and bring your conviction and truth? Will you drive out the lies of the enemy that we are too far gone? That we have done too much? That our sin is too great? That the consequences are too heavy? Holy Spirit, will you come and remind us that Jesus knows us fully and loves us completely? And Jesus, I pray especially for that that man, that woman who's in the room today. Lord, and they are, they are stuck in the darkness. Their heart is cold towards you. Their mind is closed to you. Lord, I pray that you would come today just as you did to that woman at the well. And you would speak to them personally and powerfully that you would begin to call out the sin, the bondage, the addiction, and the darkness. Lord, that you would begin to reveal you know us completely. God, begin to show us that you see the waste. Lord, you've seen the unfaithfulness. You've seen the deceitfulness. You've seen the ways, Lord, that we have harmed those closest to us. And Jesus, in spite of all that, you're still moving towards us today. So Holy Spirit, will you come and bring freedom and life? Jesus, will you well up like a spring of living water? Will you begin a deep work in our individual hearts and minds? Will you push up and push out the lies of the enemy and the effects of sin? you can begin to restore and renew, to heal and redeem. We turn our hearts back towards you, back towards our husband, back towards our wife, back towards our kid, back towards our parents. We begin to mend relationships. Will you begin to restore integrity? Will you replace hard, cold hearts with hearts that are soft towards you? ready to receive what you have to say. Jesus, we release all of it to you and we receive your new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Christian Chapel family, thanks for joining us online today for this Witness message series. 
I hope it's impacting your life. If there are things that we can pray with you about, please drop those off at christianchapel.com prayer. If you would like to partner with us in telling the story of Jesus in our community and around the world, you can do that at christianchapel.com give. My prayer for you today is that you recognize the amazing story God is writing in your life and you tell it to everyone everywhere so they can find the same experience of peace, hope, and new life that you've discovered. God bless you. Have a great week.